So Boris Johnson's heading up to Scotland today. Uh, we're not entirely certain whether he will be making any kind of public appearance or any kind of public speech, but he's written a piece uh, in the Times, uh, in the Scottish edition of the Times this morning, in which he's basically talked about how this is not just a marriage of convenience. Uh, given the number of times he's been married, you might think that's an unusual choice of words. But listen, uh, not for me to say. What I would say to you is this. We are very, very uh, good at believing what we are told from Scotland. I've worked in Scotland. You know, my antecedents are from Scotland. I still talk to an awful lot of people in Scotland. And it's true to say that independence has become a massive issue. It's become like Brexit. It was in this country, massively divisive. There are people in Scotland who are absolute fanatics about staying in the union. And there are also people who are even more fanatical about leaving it. The bottom line for me uh, is that if there was to be a second referendum, I am not at all convinced that, in fact, the vote would be yes and the vote would go the opposite way to the way it went the first time around because there are an awful lot of people, a little bit like the Brexit referendum again, an awful lot of people um, who actually don't want independence from the United Kingdom. And it's still very unclear if Scotland was to become independent, whether it would be allowed to be a separate nation within the European Union, which is what they want. It's never been quite that easy for me to understand the policy that the SNP have been pursuing, which is that they want to be independent from the UK, but they want to be dependent on the EU. Let's talk to Christine Jardy, uh, who is, of course, Lib Dem MP for Edinburgh West, to see what she makes of it all. Christine, a very good morning to you. Good morning. Thanks very much for joining us. Um, I'm not, not buying. I'm not buying this whole. You know, Boris Johnson's going up to Scotland to prop up the union. I'm not convinced by the SNP's propaganda that they have uh, enough for a majority to win an independence referendum. What do you think? Um, well, the last time we voted in Scotland, which was only December. Um, they had 45% of the votes. Now, they make an awful lot at Westminster about um, opinion polls, but, you know, opinion polls come and go, they change, and I know it's an old cliche for politicians to say it, but the only opinion poll that matters is the one on yes. the day. We had opinion polls in the last referendum which said that they were going to win, and they didn't. Right. And I think, um, you know, the last few months have been very difficult for everybody. Um, and... In some ways, I mean, I'm not going to criticise the Scottish government. Some of the things they've done have worked. Um, it will be once it, it's a bit like the UK government. It won't be until the dust has all settled and we know what decisions were the right ones and what decisions were the wrong ones. We can actually judge. But what is absolutely clear to all of us is that if it hadn't been for the union and the strength of the union and the, you know, the UK exchequer, then not just Scotland, but England, Wales and Northern Ireland, none of us would have been in a stronger position to be able to help businesses as we are. Right. And we're beginning, yeah, in, in Scotland, businesses aren't opening up as quickly as they are in the rest of the UK. That's, uh, you know, a judgment that the Scottish government have made. And a lot of people like it, a lot don't like it. And we'll see what happens at the end of it. But, I, you know, I don't think it's a case of... Boris propping up the union. No, I don't either. Um, and I, I also see, I mean, as I said uh, earlier on, I don't know if you were able to hear it, there's an awful lot of very successful propaganda that comes out of Holyrood, that comes out of, um, you know, the First Minister's um, residence uh, up there uh, in Edinburgh. And there's an awful lot of people in this country, in England, who think that the Scots are, you know, full square behind Nicola Sturgeon, which I, I don't believe to be the case either. It's not. It's abs You're absolutely right. It's not the case. I mean, I made a speech in Parliament about this just um, a couple of weeks ago. I'm sick and tired of this, you know, claiming that they speak for Scotland. They don't. Right. They speak for 45% of the people of Scotland. That's yeah. less than half. Right. So, you know, more than half of the people of Scotland are spoken for by, you know, Labour, Conservative, ourselves, and the Liberal Democrats. It's, you know, we are not full square, 100% behind the SNP. They just make the most noise and they make the most fuss about the support. Mm. Um, so, you know, no, everything is not as pro SNP in Scotland as very often we're led to believe. No, exactly. But they have sort of turned the screw and made things a little bit more nasty over the years because, you know, I never thought I would see the day. My, my parents are both from Glasgow. Uh, you know, I consider myself to be Scottish, despite the fact mm -hmm. that you would probably tell me I'm just a Sassanac. You know, the bottom line is for me. <laughs> I've um, never seen that, mate. <laughs> the bottom line is for me. You know, I never thought I'd see the day when a genuinely uh, elected MPs, democratically elected MPs, would actually say that they want a border between Scotland and England and they want police on that border to stop the English coming into Scotland No it's completely unacceptable yeah. um, and you know for a lot of Scots as well we don't like it we find you know it's a 
as someone who was, you know, born and brought up in in Glasgow, moved to Aberdeen, now has lived in Edinburgh for several years and represents Edinburgh. I've lived in all different parts of Scotland. Yeah. And in every single part of Scotland, yes, there are people who would like to be independent. But if you go to Aberdeen or Inverness or Orkney, Shetland, where the um, Orkney where the Prime Minister is today or Harris, they will, there are people there who will tell you that it's no better having a government in Edinburgh than in London. Yeah. And they don't feel any closer to the government in Edinburgh than in London. And the government in Edinburgh, they feel discriminates against, you know, the Highlands and Islands. Yeah. Everything goes to the central belt. That here in Edinburgh and Glasgow, we get everything. And that is the kind of... That's the kind of picture that people in England don't get about Scotland. It's not, you know, we're all behind the SNP and these blooming English are stopping us having independence. No. There are, you know, there are a lot of people who support the SNP, but there are more people who want to stay in the UK. And if you think about it, the argument the SNP are making at the moment is, oh, we're being torn out of an economic union. Now, I supported the European Union, as you know. Yes. We're being torn out of the European Union. So what's the answer to that? Tear ourselves out of another economic union. That makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. Exactly. And I think... Once it calms down, people will see that. Yeah, I think so. But, of course, the other problem is that more people voted for Brexit in Scotland than voted for the SNP. And so there are people <laughs> in Scotland who did actually want to leave the European Union. But the bottom line as well, Christine, for me... Uh, is Most of them it, are SNP supporters. Well, isn't that bizarre? I mean, the bottom line for me is they don't even have a plan. And my, 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 my point earlier on as well is that I don't actually believe that there's a genuine um, wish by Nicola Sturgeon to have a second referendum because whichever result that comes out of it... She's done, because if you don't need the SNP, if you've got independence, you need a proper political party with proper policies, not just sort of, you know, gathering around one single issue. And if they lose it, they're done as well. So, you know, I think they prefer to just stand there complaining, saying we can't get the powers that we want. Look at those horrible people in Westminster. They won't give us what we want. And they just like the fight. Yeah. And I think one of the things that um, they, they make a big deal, they, ref, the devolution referendum and devolution in Scotland followed um, the Thatcher government in the 80s, which was incredibly unpopular in Scotland. Yeah. They lost all their MPs. And the SNP see this. You know, Boris is unpopular. This is another opportunity to sort of, you know, blame um, the Tories. Now, I'm, you know, not averse to blaming the government for things it that has it been is known. responsible for. Um, you know, I've said it once or twice. But what they forget in this is that independence for Scotland would not be about Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson is just one Prime Minister. Yes. The Conservative Party, if there was an independent Scotland, the Scottish Conservative Party would still exist. So this argument they make about wanting Tories out of Scotland and it not being a government Scotland voted for doesn't actually stand up when you scrutinise it. Yeah. And the other thing about it, Scotland voted for the government in Holyrood. The United Kingdom voted for the government at Westminster. Yes. Exactly and they also right. they make this thing about Scotland not being part of Westminster. Does you know I'll say it politely. That's nonsense because it's ten years since we had the second Scottish Prime Minister in a row, and we've had loads of them. Mm. Um, Scottish Foreign Ministers, Chancellors of the Exchequer. If you look at the government just now, there are cabinet ministers who are Scottish, mm. if, and other ministers. You look at the opposition front benches. You have Scots. We have Scots. Scots are not separate from Westminster, we are part of it. And the argument that the SNP make just for a lot of us in Scotland is a very shallow, very pointed, very sort of narrow visioned, you know, nationalism. It's all about it's all about one thing, and they mm. don't look at what is actually best in the long run for all of us. No. And also, I've not really ever seen, despite the fact that Nicola Sturgeon would no doubt argue with me, any uh, cogent sort of plan as to what Scotland outside of the UK would look like. You know, we've talked endlessly, you and I, about Brexit and the various trade deals that might have to be yeah. done inside and outside. We've talked about Northern Ireland. We've talked about the border in the middle of the sea. You know, nobody's actually said, well, where would the border be between Scotland and England? And, where, and what would that mean exactly? To be fair to them, they did produce a white paper in uh, 2012, 2013. Yeah, I said cogent. 2014 referendum. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good point. Yeah. You did say cogent. Yeah. Um, and it was, um, it was torn apart, basically, because it didn't allow for the fact, you know, what currency would Scotland have? Mm. Um, you know, would we have the pound? Would we have a different currency? Would we take the euro? They talk about rejoining Europe. 
Well, you know what? Europe would have to agree to that. There's 20 well, exactly. countries would and have also, to agree to that. There's an understanding from some in Europe, and I'm not sure that everybody would have this view, that the EU would not be that keen uh, to encourage uh, independence for Scotland because they then have the Catalan problem in Spain. The Catalan, yeah. Catalan Nobody and, wants you know, that. Other, uh, Walloon and, and, and Belgium, and no, they don't want that precisely. And, yeah. Um, you know, the, the Spanish would be against it. The other problem is, of course, there are rules that you have to, there are criteria that you have to meet to join the European Union. And frankly, Scotland wouldn't meet them. Yeah. Um, and after the experiences with, you know, Greece narrowly made it, and there are all sorts of accusations about that. And then it was very difficult a few years for Greece and for the European Union. Yes. They're not going to want that again because they no longer have the UK. Um, so there are fewer big, strong countries in it. You know, so if Scotland came in, um, but, you know, it just, it would cause problems for everybody. And I'm, I doubt very much if it would be as easy as the SNP continually likes to mm. tell us. No, exactly right. And as far as the whole kind of um, devolution movement uh, went, as far as, it, as far as it goes, I mean, what's your yeah. view on whether they should kind of try and increase the powers that Scotland has? I mean, they already have some powers for tax raising that they don't actually use. Um, I mean, that. would you be in favour of giving Holyrood more powers? Well, I was in favour, and we did after the the um, 2014 referendum. The 2016 Scotland Act made it the most powerful devolved parliament in the world, mm. and it does have tax raising powers. And in Scotland now, we pay more tax than the rest of the United Kingdom. And there's been a huge row at Westminster um, between the Conservatives and the SNP because if you serve in the armed forces and you are based in Scotland, yeah. you pay more tax right. than if you're based anywhere else. So there's been a big been a big argument about that. But you're right, they don't use all the powers that they have. They didn't use the tax powers. John Swinney actually let them, this is before the, the new tax raising powers, the original ones, the mm. SNP let lapse yeah. because you have to renew them every year. So they, they lapsed. And they now have welfare um, powers that, that they were going to bring in. But no, no, they don't use them. They've put them off. And the WASPy women, which is a huge thing right across the UK, uh, the women born in the 1950s yes. who had their pension age changed. And, uh, you know, there's a court case going on about that at the moment. The SNP have campaigned for those women to have their money. But the SNP government at Holyrood, which has the power to actually do something to mitigate the circumstances, doesn't do it. Yes, isn't that interesting? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I, the trouble as well with all of this talk of, of separation is that there are people now that I hear from on this show from England who say, give us the referendum on Scotland and we'll make sure that they become independent. And I worry <laughs> that there are people in, in, in England yeah. now who feel kind of resentment towards Scotland. And that's not what I want to see. What I would like to see for England, if I'm absolutely honest, is I would like to see what, what would be better for all of us across the United Kingdom is a more federal structure. Yeah. Um, and for I was I was watching um, BBC. Sorry to say that on here, but I was Bad watching luck. Um, no, a television long, station. Let's say yeah, this morning, <laughs> um, and they were talking about the um, Grant Chaps was talking about the money that the UK government's putting into the north of England at yeah. the moment. And it struck me that you know areas like Manchester, Liverpool, Leeds, down in Cornwall, these are all areas which could do with some form of devolution. London, yeah, as a very successful devolved authority we forget that that london has devolution so i think the the answer to all of this the answer to scottish independence arguments is that the rest of the united kingdom should have the same sort of devolution as we have and that westminster should become a more federal parliament for um the rest of the country what you mean and you'd stop that, having scottish mps you mean no, you'd still have Scottish MPs, you'd still have English MPs and Welsh MPs and Northern Irish MPs. But in the same way as you have MSPs for Scotland who um, deal with education, housing, right. transport, you would have um, members of a North of England Parliament or a Cornwall Parliament uh -huh. or whatever who dealt with those issues or whatever the people in that area thought was relevant, those issues in um, in their region. Right. Because the problem that we have at the moment is that we have an asymmetric system of government. Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland all have different systems of government and different from, from England. And yeah. England is actually the one which I feel um, is losing out at the moment. Yeah, it's interesting. Because being that. a Liberal Democrat, I think that the most effective way of running things is to have the, the governing power devolved to where it's closest to yes. the community. Which would be fine as long as you did away with the House of Lords, because otherwise you're just introducing yet another layer oh. of, of, uh, of, of politicians Absolutely. and more public money. 
But being a Liberal Democrat, you're preaching to the converted about <laughs> the House of Lords. And all well, hang on, you've got more people in, in there than, uh, than you've got in, 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 in the House of Commons, though. At the moment, it didn't used to be like that, but at the moment, and hopefully it won't be like that in the future, we'll fix that. But yeah, the, I mean, we did try to reform the House of Lords. That was in our manifesto, and we tried to, we tried to get it done in the coalition, and the Tories just yeah. wouldn't wait it. But, you know, I think that that has to be something, that has to be the next... That's to be the next thing we look at as well, is, you know, really, in the 21st century, do we want an unelected upper chamber? I think it's us, the only two countries in the world who have that are us, and I think it's Lesotho. Yeah. Um, so It's also, I think, only, century, it's, it's, on. it's only, it, the only other bigger chamber with the number of people in it that we have is in China. You know, so yeah, I mean, and look at the size of China. Well, yeah, exactly, it's ridiculous. And it's not I mean, even proper democracy, for heaven's sake. Now, one uh, one final question for you, Christine. If yeah. in fact you were a betting woman, I don't know whether you are. Uh, <laughs> would you say you, we will see an independence referendum in Scotland in this in this Parliament, this Westminster Parliament? Oh, that's a sixty-four thousand dollar question. I think the Scottish Nationalists will do their utmost to get one. Right, but um, I tend, I tend to doubt it. Um, of course I would say that because I don't want one. Um, I want to um, I want to continue to devolution the process mm. and I want to continue um, with the devolution process. I want a more federal UK. I don't want an independence referendum. Can you imagine the money that would be wasted oh, in God. that? Yeah, no. We've had eight, nearly nine years now of division and argument in Scotland about independence and Brexit. We've got to put a stop to it and, you know, just get on with the day-to-day -day business of running the country. Yeah, I totally get back agree. To, you know, making people's lives better and helping them where we can and put all the narrow and nationalist ranting and arguments, put it all behind us. Yeah. Move on and start being positive. Well said. Christine Jardin there, uh, who is, of course, Lib Dem MP for Edinburgh West. Be positive, get on with it, stop whinging, and you're not going to get a referendum anyway. That's the message from the Independent Republic of Mike Graham to the SNP, to Nicola Sturgeon and to Scotland. So there.